will do now. Please call James Doby. James Doby, please. Let him be sworn. What is your religion? <coughs> Take the book in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God, the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the old truth, nothing but the truth. Now, what is your full name, Mr. Doby? James Alfred Doby, sir. And where do you live? Um, 15A, Sydney Street, Fulchester, sir. And you are a scrap merchant with a scrapyard at that address? Yes, sir. Do you remember an occasion on the 11th of May this year when Ernest Richards and Jack Smith were at your yard? No, sir. An occasion when Smith negotiated to buy copper from Ernest Richards? No, sir. Are you saying there never was such an occasion or that you don't recall that occasion? No, I don't recall it, sir. Hmm. Did you sell any copper to Richards this year? Very likely, sir. But I couldn't swear on oath. Well, Mr Smith says he and Richards had a discussion about the copper and that you discussed the price with them. And he goes on to say Jimmy Doby was lying on the floor and he didn't say a word. Now, can you assist us about this? No, that's a lie. I mean, I might have been drunk. I can be paralytic, but I never stopped talking. Mr Doby, cannot you recall anything of this? No, sir. But it's a lie. Very well, Mr. Doby. You may go. Thank you, sir. Can anyone tell me the time? Is it after half past eleven? Yes, it is, Mr. Doby. It is after opening time. Thank you, sir. It's sorry I couldn't help, sir. Mm. Well, I can see now why none of you called him as a witness. Very well, Mr. Golding. My lord, members of the jury... In spite of the shoal of red herrings cast by my two learned friends, this is a straightforward case, a case of theft and assault. A clear case made somewhat cloudy by the defendant's absurd stories. Take his tale of the alleged sale of copper. A sale by a scrap dealer on credit. An agreement that the scrap should be collected surreptitiously at night, that night. Take the assault. Do you really believe his story that Mrs Richards, a small woman, attacked he and the boy with a crowbar? It's not really credible, is it? Now, what about the boy? He admitted to me that he knew it was wrong to steal or to attack people. So the only question is his age. Well, he certainly looks ten, doesn't he? And the only evidence that he's not so is that of Smith, a man with a lengthy record of criminal offences and previous unsuccessful attempts to talk his way out of tight corners. Members of the jury... In my submission, the evidence is clearly all one way, and I therefore ask for a verdict of guilty on all counts. Thank you, Mr. Golding. Mr. Deavy? My lord. <coughs> Members of the jury, you may remember that earlier in this case, I made a submission to the effect that there was no case to answer with regard to my client on the grounds of age. Now, I contend that my submission still holds good. However... It is for you, and for you alone, to decide the age of Leo Trotsky. Now, here is a most unfortunate child who has become the victim of circumstances beyond his control or his understanding. He's illegitimate, he was abandoned by his mother, and he's lacking in any education whatsoever. Now, whether you question his lifestyle or his motives, Jack Smith has been Leo Trotsky's only salvation. He's given him a home a sense of security, and as we have seen in this court today, he's given him genuine love and affection. And Leo Trotsky, on his part, has returned that love and affection and given his loyalty to Mr. Smith. It is obvious the boy has lived with Mr. Smith all his life. Despite the fact that the prosecution has tried to discredit this story, there was no evidence brought forward to contradict it. And the boy himself can remember living with no one else but Jack Smith all his life. 
Members of the jury, I contend that, Jack, that, beg your pardon, that Leo Trotsky is under 10 years of age and cannot be convicted of a crime. But if you have any doubts concerning the boy's age, they must be to his benefit. If you convict this boy, the tragedy begun the day after he was born will be complete. You must return a verdict of not guilty. May it please your lordship. Members of the jury, you have two simple questions to answer. Did my client steal this copper or did he assault Mrs. Richards? Now, my learned friend has made much moment of Mr. Smith's prison record, but let me remind you that he's had no convictions against him since he became Leo Trotsky's father. Because you must realize, members of the jury, that no matter what you think or what anyone else thinks about the manner in which this boy has been brought up, Jack Smith and Leo Trotsky have become father and son. Now, for nearly 10 years, my client has looked after the interests of this boy, and during that time, no criminal charges were brought against him. So why should he suddenly revert to a life of crime, knowing that if convicted, he'd lose custody of his adopted son? And having seen the bond that exists between them, you will realize that it's a very high price for him to pay. And if I may add, an even higher price for Leo Trotsky to pay. And you also may ask why he should steal from a man who himself was admitted to being a close friend of my client's for many years. I would also ask you to recall, members of the jury, that on the night the police stopped his van, he immediately allowed the van to be searched. He immediately admitted that the copper had come from Richard's scrapyard. Now, surely not the actions of a thief. Now, you may have thought at first it seemed ludicrous for a grown man and a boy to have to defend themselves against a normal-looking, middling lady. But having seen and heard her, I am sure, like me, none of you would like to meet this particular middling lady wielding a three-foot crowbar on a dark night. Now, it is not for you, members of the jury, to decide why uh, Richard is lying about the sale of this copper. If you believe my client's story to be remotely true, even remotely true, you must find him not guilty. Because to find him guilty, it must be beyond all reasonable doubt. And I am therefore confident that you will find him not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Now, members of the jury, in this case, you must, before you can convict, be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that Smith and the boy stole the load of copper, and that the injuries that they inflicted on Mrs. Richards were inflicted other than in the exercise of the right to use reasonable force in self-defense. Now, if you are satisfied over these matters, then your verdict will be for Smith guilty. But you will have to consider further the position of the boy before you could convict him. For a verdict of guilty to be appropriate in his case, you would have to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that at the time of the alleged offences, he was over ten years old and that he knew that what he was doing was wrong. Will you now retire to consider your verdict? All stand. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? Yes. On the first count of theft, do you find the accused Leo Trotsky guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. And in the same count, do you find the accused Jack Smith guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. On the second count of assault, occasioning actual bodily harm, do you find the accused Leo Trotsky guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. And on the same account, do you find the accused Jack Smith guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Very well, Smith. You may go. And the boy will be returned to the school. Don't worry. Keep your wagger up, son. We'll soon have it. Oh.
Next week, a chance for you to join another jury in assessing the facts when our cameras return to watch a leading case in the Crown Court. <laughs>